I'm standing now in the middle of something we all take for granted, a modern factory. Machines, power, a labour force, mass production. Yet, these machines are performing one of the oldest manufacturing processes known to man. So old that we don't know where it started or when. You see, what these machines are doing is spinning. Spinning is just a way of taking the fibres of raw wool, say, or raw cotton like this and turning them into thread. The simplest way to spin is just to take some individual fibres of the cotton, to tease them out and pull them out like this and to twist them between finger and thumb. There. You see how the fibres are beginning to cling together to form a continuous thread or yarn. And it's from yarn that we make cloth. Spinning was one of man's earliest discoveries, but there was a problem. It takes hours and hours to produce enough yarn for even a small piece of cloth. We needed to invent a piece of machinery to help us. And here it is, the spinning wheel. The spinner's left hand still draws out the fibres, but the wheel is turning a pulley that turns the spindle. The fibres fall off the end of the spindle, and that puts in the twist. And this was how yarns of all kinds, wool, linen, cotton, went on being made. In homes all over the world, one of the best-known sounds was the whirring of the spinning wheel. And nearby, the clanking of the loom as the weaver passed the shuttle carrying the yarn of the weft through the up and down threads called the warp to make cloth. But about 200 years ago, our population began to grow faster and faster and so did our trade overseas. So we needed more of everything, including cloth. We needed a better weaving machine. All sorts of people tried to invent one. One of the most successful was John Kay, who invented this device in 1733, the flying shuttle. Instead of passing the shuttle across by hand, the weaver now pulled a handle, or picking peg. The picker, a sort of hammer, sends the shuttle which carries the warp flying across the loom and through the threads of the weft. This speeded up weaving enormously. The problem now was a shortage of spun yarn. We needed a better spinning machine. The first successful new machine was the spinning jenny, invented by James Hargreaves in 1764. A long carriage is pulled back while a wheel turns a number of spindles. The cotton falls off the end of the spindles and is twisted to make the yarn. The carriage returns and the spun yarn is wound onto the spindle. There were problems though. The jenny was difficult to operate, so it required a highly skilled worker. And the thread it made was not really strong enough to form the warp, the up and down threads. It tended to snap. So the search for a better and simpler way of spinning went on. And the man who found it was a sharp-witted barber and wig maker from Preston in Lancashire. Richard Arkwright, peruke maker, hair cutter, in the neatest and best fashion. As Arkwright travelled around Lancashire, buying hair for his perukes or wigs, he heard a great deal of talk about the shortage of yarn. He soon realised that there was a fortune waiting for the man 
who could come up with an efficient, easy to operate spinning machine. And that man, he decided, was going to be Richard Arkwright. He borrowed an idea from here, another from there, added one or two of his own, and came up with his own spinning frame. And this is a replica of the machine he built and patented in 1769. But here is the real thing, an original working machine, Arkwright's spinning frame. The machine was power driven. The cotton was drawn through three carefully spaced rollers and a set of flyers or spindles put in the twist. The machine worked and it didn't need a skilled operator. It's now that the big difference between Arkwright and the other cotton inventors begins to show itself. He was a much better businessman. Instead of starting to turn out small versions of his frames for people to use in their homes, like Hargreaves had done with the spinning jenny, Arkwright dreamt of rivers of yarn, pouring from dozens, hundreds of his machines, all under one roof and all driven by power. In fact, what he wanted to build was a factory. To do that, he needed money. He had to find a backer. And to do that, he left Lancashire and went down across the Midlands to Nottingham. In Nottingham and Derby, there was a huge stocking-making industry. The factories needed vast quantities of strong cotton yarn for their spinning frames. Jedediah Strutt was the owner of a thriving stocking-knitting business. Strutt and Arkwright became partners. With Strutt's money, they set up a workshop in Nottingham getting their source of power from horses. But horses weren't good enough for Arkwright and Strutt. They wanted to put more frames side by side. They needed something stronger than horsepower. So Arkwright moved north to a village in Derbyshire called Cromford. Here, there was a stronger source of power available water. In August of 1771, Arkwright and his partners leased this plot of land and started to build. In December 1771, it was finished. And there it is, the first successful factory in the world. Originally, it had five stories, but the top two were destroyed by fire. To get a clearer picture of what it was like, we need to move a couple of miles up the road to a later and undamaged mill, the Harlem Mill at Worksworth, which was also built by Arkwright. For most people in this area, these were the biggest buildings they'd ever seen in their lives. The plan and shape of those early Arkwright mills became standard for the early factories. One factory owner said, we all looked up to him and imitated his mode of building. Basically, they were very simple rectangular blocks, three or more stories high and about 30 feet wide. The buildings were full of long rooms, like this one. There are rows of quite large windows down either side of the room to let in as much light as possible. You've got to imagine two rows of Arkwright's frames down each side of the room, all taking their power from one long central driving shaft that was hung from these beams above me. 
the shaft was turned by a water wheel below us. Cromford's water wheels have long gone. One used to be over there in that corner. You can still see where that pipe used to pour water onto the wheel to make it turn. The other wheel was over there, set into a pit at the end of the wall. Arkwright leased not only this piece of land, but also the right to use the water that came tumbling down the hills above us. There were two main sources of water power, a drain from the lead mines and the less reliable Bonsall Brook. To store the power of this quite small stream, Arkwright built a series of dams which made a chain of ponds where he could store the water. This is one of the ponds. It's now shallow and overgrown with weeds. The last pond is the biggest of all. The water from the brook enters the pond across there and leaves for the mill just there, below me. Before Arkwright came here, Cromford was an isolated hamlet. There were a few local people here already, mainly lead miners and their wives and children. Arkwright needed labour. Wanted at Cromford, in the county of Derby, weavers with large families. Likewise, children of all ages, above seven years old, may have constant employment. Children of all ages. That reminds us that Arkwright's machines didn't need workers with strength and skill. The water wheels and the frames had that. All the worker had to do was keep an eye on things, nipping in when necessary to tie or piece together any broken thread. Nimble-fingered children could do that as well as adults, and they were a lot cheaper. The children and the adults were called to the mill by a bell which rang out over the village, and the mill worked day and night in two 12-hour shifts. These cotton mills, seven stories high and filled with inhabitants, remind me of a first-rate man of war. And when they are lighted up at night, they look luminously beautiful. It may have looked luminously beautiful from the outside, but inside, it must have been less romantic. Working a long day shift or a long night shift, six days a week, day in, day out, and obeying the strict rules of the factory, or else. Any spinner found with his window open, find one shilling. Any spinner found dirty at his work, find one shilling. Any spinner heard whistling, find one shilling. Weavers or spinners had always worked hard, but up to now, they'd worked at home, and they'd set their own discipline. But there's no evidence that Arkwright was a cruel man, even if he was hard. He seemed to know that if his business were to prosper, he'd need to attract workers and then take care of them. He built decent homes for his workers, houses that are still good to live in two centuries later, solidly built of good Derbyshire gritstone. These houses here in North Street were built for his weavers and their families. At five or six in the morning, mum and the kids would set off for the mill, leaving dad at home, weaving yarn into cloth. That's where dad worked, up there at the top of the house, with long windows to give him plenty of light whilst he worked away at his loom. Arkwright also built a school, a chapel, and here in the centre of the village, this fine hotel, the Greyhound. Round it were shops 
and on Saturdays, a market was held here. Astonished gentry, as well as traders, stayed in the Greyhound, marvelling at Cromford. Perhaps they might have seen the festival Arkwright staged each September, with a great parade and a feast. A festival that even had its own theme song. Ye numerous assembly that make up this throng, spare your mirth for a moment and list to my song. The bounties let's sing that our master belong. At the cotton mills now at Cromford, the famous renowned cotton mills. The Cromford mills made tremendous profits, and soon Arkwright was building more at Matlock, just up the river, in Nottinghamshire, Lancashire, and even far away Scotland. Within only six years of starting up at Cromford, Arkwright was employing over 5,000 people. And in 1787, he became Sir Richard Arkwright, High Sheriff of Derbyshire. The barber and wig maker from Preston had come a long way, and he wanted everyone to know it. For years, he'd lived up there at Rock House, where he could look down on his mills. But now he decided it was time for something better. Gangs of men were set to work on this wooded hillside. They cut down trees and blasted away rocks to clear the ground for a fine new house. There it is, Willersley Castle. But Willersley Castle never became Arkwright's home. He died on the 3rd of August, 1792, before he could move in. He was 59 years old. Arkwright was an inventor and an innovator. But above all, he was a businessman. He made a system work. He was important to us because of what you see here today. It may not look much now, but what we're looking at is the start of our world. This small, rather battered group of buildings is where mass-powered production began, with everything that meant for good or ill. If you have to pick out one man who brought the ingredients of our industrial world together, the machines, the power, the people, the organization. No one has a better claim than Richard Arkwright. Ye hungry and naked, all hither repair. No longer in want, don't remain in despair. You meet with employment and each get a share At the cotton mills now at Cromford The famous renowned cotton mills To our noble master a bumper then filled